start. And this is the part when I feel nervous, um, but there's attendees already because duh, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, friends, if you are here to celebrate the book birthday of Boys in the Void, a mixtape for my brother, for my, to my brother, mm, got it all messed up already, a mixtape to my brother, you are in the right place. I am so delighted to be celebrating here with Jira Asim and Sasha Bonet and special guest JC Asim, who will be talking, we'll be talking to him a little bit. Um, I'm just going to let this room populate with your biggest fans, um, including our bookstore owner, um, Paul Swyden, who is here. So, hey, Paul. Um, what up, Paul? <laughs> nice. Um, let's talk for a second. You know, this is the part where I ask what's going on in people's backgrounds. And I would love to know what's on your bookshelf, Jira. Is there a special book, that book that's been getting you through the panty? Like, what's that thing <laughs> that you are reaching for that's giving you comfort and joy right now? Um, well, so many, I wouldn't even know where to start, but I feel like at an event like this, you know, one of the unique benefits of the Zoom era is I feel like I can kind of have my peoples with me. So I got a <laughs> Langston Hughes right there to channel. I got my other younger brother, uh, Jelani, he's mentioned in the book, and my late uncle is also an artist, a visual artist, uh, all looking on. And it's kind of like the, uh, the paintings of the past presidents. Um, and whatever room that is in Harry Potter, but but we get to have it at a book launch. Um, and I'm excited about that. That's awesome. That is so wonderful. Sasha, I like I, I you have a beautiful bookshelf behind you. It is very artful and cool. Is there <laughs> is there a book back there? What are you reaching for during the panty times? That's such a good question. I feel like um, I've been reading a lot of Octavia Butler mm. um, as it feels just it feels like a bit like escapism, but it's also so much related to everything that we're going through right now. Um, so I've been kind of enjoying that, escaping the current realities and kind of living in these um, Afrofuturistic places that she creates for us. And also, of course, Boys in the Void. <laughs> Okay. obviously I'm just gonna hold this up <laughs> because today is the day it is so beautiful it feels so no, good it's so beautiful it the really cover's is so great I love it I love the size it's really a, it's really beautifully done is there anything cool we can know about the cover did you did you get to choose it did you get to collaborate on it or anything g -Ra? I'm not a hugely visual dude so I kind of just wrote a description um and Lewis Rowe kind of took it and ran with it uh, one of the kind of recurring images um, in the book is this notion of a black sheep and the, the symbolism that the black sheep has in punk rock culture and the kind of odd uh, multivalence of black sheep, right? Usually it's a, it's a racially neutral term. Um, but of course, when you're a black person in the punk scene, you're both a literal and figurative black sheep. And so there are some... Uh, you can kind of see in the corner here some references to Minor Threat's first demo. Their album cover has an image kind of like this. And uh, this is just sort of um, this artist's own kind of spin on that pretty iconic image. That's awesome. This is amazing. This is going to be so good, y'all. This is going to be so good. I'm so excited. Um, I'm going to get us started because the hour is ever so short. Um, Good evening. My name is Kira Wilson-Cook. I am the events coordinator for the Silver Unicorn Bookstore in Acton, Massachusetts. It is a delight to be here with two professors, two writers, um, and celebrating the, the publication, the launch of this brand new book, Boys in the Void. Um, Jira is a Ithaca College professor, a writer, a commentator, uh, a musician, and everything else, Renaissance man, can I call you that? Like, I just feel like that's what you are. Like, I'm I'm putting that on you, if that's a thing. I'm not a Renaissance man. I'm a Renaissance man. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I have to do that's it. great. Yes to you. Yes. And then- Shout out to Ho. Indeed. And um, I am here. I, so Jira is here in conversation <laughs> with Sasha Bonet, who is also a professor at the Parson New School of Design um, and is also a writer and a critic. 
And what else did I write down for you? All the things, all the things. And a curator, which I think is just like the best word to describe anyone for anything. And I hope that when you talk about that in this conversation, um, Sasha and G Rob will be uh, joined by JC, who is also a writer. And there's a question around that. So I can't wait to hear a little bit more um, later in the hour before I disappear, because I know I'm taking up all the air and the space in the room, and I'm so sorry about that. I have a couple of things to say. The first is y'all are utilizing the chat beautifully. Continue to do so. But if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A so that way we can keep them separate and keep them in a place where we can find them. I will be back at about 745 to help facilitate your questions and get you some answers. Um, you should know that this book, Boys in the Void, is available at the Silver Unicorn Bookstore in Acton, Mass. So if you're local, come see us. And if you're not local, that's okay, because this book is available at an independent bookstore, independent, near you. So go get it. And with that, I'm going to disappear and uh, be back at 7045. Um, congratulations, g -Rod. This is a triumph. It's such a gift to the community. Um, we're so honored to launch it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us and for that warm welcome and scene setting uh, this evening, Kira. Absolutely. Thank you, Kira. That was wonderful. <laughs> Hi, g -Ra. Sasha. Hello. Hello. So I think we should start off by at least like letting the people know our relationship to one another, right? Like it feels like it should be right. So Jira and I are really good friends, my dearest, dearest friend. And we actually met in graduate school um, in our nonfiction writing um, <laughs> courses, right? And um, one thing I just want to start off by saying, because I think it's important to the book, is that one thing that kind of started our relationship and, and drew us to one another was partially because we were a few, only a few Black people in the program, but also because I said to Jira that I felt like I didn't know that he existed in the world. I didn't know that I could ever meet a friend like him. And he said to me, that he always knew I existed. He just didn't know where he was gonna find me. And I think that that's such a great way to talk about this book, which Boys in the Void is about this kind of post-conventional identity acting in accord with a vision of the self that is not necessarily self-evident. And um, so it, I feel like this book and our relationship have been developing at kind of the same pace because you started writing this book, correct? In the writing program that, that we studied in, right? Yeah. So one way I think about what you're saying is uh, often when I'm introducing the personal essay as a form to my students, we go way back. We talk about Michelle de Montaigne uh, and we talk about you know, who some people consider the progenitor um, of the personal essay. Some people you know, view him as the greatest essayist of all time. Uh, and one of the features of the personal essay as a form uh, comes from Montaigne's relationship with his dear friend, Labo T, who was uh, an intellectual, a statesman, um, not necessarily a writer himself, but who, uh, someone who concerned himself with a lot of the same ideas that Montaigne is famous for um, pursuing in print. And, uh, you know, the sad part of the story, of course, is that Montaigne got into writing personal essays after Labo T passed away uh, fairly young, at least by our standards. And so the reader, uh, when you're engaging with a Montaigne personal essay is the stand-in for Labo T because that was his confidant, um, someone he sort of workshopped his ideas with. Um, and he's kind of like the ideal interlocutor. And so Sasha has kind of been my Montaigne or my Labo T as I was developing this book. Um, and even before I knew that this book was gonna be a thing. So only appropriate that we be here uh, today celebrating it, launching it, and exiting the void together. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that's so real. And I feel like Jossie, who will be joining us later, who is Jira's brother, who the book is written to, um, it's written as a mixtape, and you kind of use the mixtape as a conceit, as it stems from both your relationship with punk and your relationship as a professor. 
So I kind of wanted to start there in talking about the form that you chose using Jossie um, as a person to speak to, but also you didn't have, from what I understand, you didn't have necessarily um, a JIRA in your life to introduce you to understanding how to move through, not necessarily painting a picture that the world is going to be, um, that there's a way to cure the world, but that there's a way to move through the world that can make living as a black man easier, um, especially if you consider yourself a person living in the void, right? So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you came to this conception of creating it as a mixtape and then the relationship between the mixtape and as you've spoken about the, the essay, like bringing all of these ideas into one because you could have written a memoir, right? You could have easily written a memoir. Your family is woven through beautifully. There's a lot of history and then there's the personal experiences but you chose to do the essay collection and that really lends itself also to the mixtape, which is essentially a love letter. You know, you send a mixtape to your crush. I mean, back in the nineties, <laughs> you could like record, you know, from the radio and send and give that tape in the mail um, or give it to your crush or your friend. So I kind of want to speak to you about how you arrived at the idea to do the essay collection instead of the memoir for this work. Yeah, I think the the using a mixtape as a vehicle um, is really related to what you're pointing out about the deliberate decision to go more of the essay route than the memoir route. I always joke about how I don't really enjoy reading and don't feel capable of writing what I call dark and stormy night nonfiction. <laughs> I was born on a dark and stormy night, <laughs> right? Where it's like, there's not necessarily... Um, a clear principle by which the writer is determining determining what so what personal information to include or not, uh, and I've you know to be candid, I felt a little bit hamstrung by that when I began. I was like, you know, uh, what, how much of narrative or, or personal experience in the world do I need to include in this book in order for um, the things I'm interested in saying about punk music and straight edge culture to to stand for them to feel, uh, you know, grounded in a real person's experience. And that the mixtape, once I arrived at that as the, the structure, um, kind of gave me permission to sort of work in particular anecdotes, but maybe leave out others, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, an experience I have as a punk rocker so often is like, you know, people will have a certain kind of curiosity, um, like, oh, you know, how did you, how, how could you get into Bad Brains or, or Minor Threat, which is music that in the book I describe as uh, being more similar to uh, the oral equivalent of spitting on the listener than wrapping the listener in a warm embrace, right? It's music that in some ways is designed to uh, generate an aversive reaction. So if that's the case, it's hard to sometimes to um, share the experience or make your affinity for this music communicable just by playing the record because if you listen to it you might be like this is just it's dissonant it's discordant the dude can't sing uh why are the snare drums tuned that way etc so i thought this idea of annotating a mixtape right like mm -hmm. using the song um as a center of gravity for a given chapter but then letting the annotation take whatever discursive directions emerge or seem appropriate to contextualize in the song. Uh, I thought that might help to kind of get around that problem that is so familiar to me um, as like a devotee of this scene of this subculture uh, who's mostly friends with people who aren't, uh, including Jossie, who we'll hear from shortly. Who aren't punk? Yeah, who, who aren't, um, you know, who are the uninitiated, so to speak. Right, right, right. Which I still feel like this book is so ex accessible for people who aren't initiated, like myself, um, but are still able to read it and have a certain understanding and fit it into um, different cultural experiences and art, art that we're exploring. Um, but I am curious, because you talk about this in your book, about having this poetry assignment I want to say it was in um, evidence of things unseen. 
um, that chapter, you talk about this assignment that you have in kind of annotating, using music to make annotations and feeling an attraction to that at even a young age. And then you kind of pull back from academia later on in life which you, you take us there, even though you grew up in this family, which I love the family characters, Black Mamba, who is the mother of Jira and Jossie, shows up throughout the book quite often as this kind of guiding force, um, who doesn't always quite understand her children, but is still like trying to push them into, um, you know, academia and success basically to like keep them alive, right? Um, but then also, you, Jira, navigating that for yourself and providing um, another alternative way for your mother to respond to your brother's decisions mm -hmm. because you are 14 years apart, right? So that's like a whole generation, which is a big part of the, the, the book as well. So, yeah, I mean, you cover a lot of ground there. I think one of the main um, takeaways I, I hope to produce in writing a story like this and kind of performing analyses like these was that I, I felt like I was in a position um, being a product of this kind of unusual bohemian upbringing where merely um, choosing to internalize the values that were impressed upon me at home and embodying that outside of the home would be interpreted by the people around me as a rebellion. So if you if you're square one is kind of like a countercultural zone, then just by like doing normal things that people do, like imitating their parents or more or less uh, adopting their moral outlook or their politics, uh, becomes this thing that kind of distances you from your peers or that makes you you know distinct from what's going on in mass culture. Mm -hmm. That sort of put me in a position where punk and straight edge were intuitively appealing to me because I kind of felt like I was already um, shoved a certain nonconformist direction by default. Um, and I figured, well, I'm halfway there, you know, might as well <laughs> take it all the way kind of thing. Right, uh, right. And so alongside that, you know, you mentioned this assignment that I present as kind of like an origin story in eighth grade, um, a, an English teacher, assigned us, um, we were told we had to choose some poems and analyze them for you know, literary merit or the use of uh, embroidered language. And we were allowed a loophole where two of the poems could be pop songs if we wanted. And one kid brought in two songs by the band Operation Ivy who uh, figure heavily into Boys in the Void. And if you can even picture this, right, this is like a 12 year old kid uh, bringing in lyrics that he hand copied from, you know, the Alta Vista or like a Yahoo search engine. And <laughs> he's talking about them on an overhead projector. Remember those? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and kind of breaking down like, hey, this, you know, here's what this line is an allusion to. And, and here's the social context in which it was written, you know, this band got together in the late 80s. Uh, so interestingly, I was more able to appreciate uh, what Operation Ivy was doing, what kind of aesthetic tradition they were working in. When it was presented to me uh, as a poem, it was, it was easier to absorb than it would be if I had heard it first, because like, you know, as, as I alluded to earlier, it's, it's not immediately gratifying or accessible music. Uh, and then it was only years later when our mutual friend Sabrina actually pointed out to me that the singer of Operation Ivy, the main lyricist, is actually this, his name is Jesse Michaels. He's actually the son of Leonard Michaels, Michaels who is mm -hmm. a known essayist, fiction writer, uh, and was a professor of English at the University of California, Berkeley. So this band that became my gateway punk band. Uh, maybe became that because the singer and I shared this kind of uh, bohemian, you know, vigorously intellectual upbringing that perhaps led to simpatico views of the world. So I didn't really know at the time what I 
immediately gravitated toward or understood about Operation Ivy. And it's actually funny that only after years of engagement with the band, um, you know, one of our good friends would give me this clue that having this, this background in common, despite, you know, the racial disparities in our backgrounds, um, probably was, was part of the connective tissue that, that made the whole thing go. I'm so curious about that. I still haven't worked out entirely like how you're growing up in this bohemian family. Both of your parents are artists. You're spending so much time at bookshops, like, you know, at launches like this, and then being against, you know, being against academia, being against, you know, being a writer. And you also, I wanted to to bring this up when, when Jossie joins us about um, in the second chapter, Evidence of Things Unseen, there's a part, and maybe I can read from it actually. Um, there is a part where you're describing an experience that happens with you in your nonfiction writing program and an experience that happens with Jossie kind of similarly at the same time um, in high school where his newspaper editor thinks that he's plagiarized um, some work that he's written and then your professor is saying to you you need to bring a more authentic voice why aren't you being yourself in which she means why aren't you being what I imagine you should be or why aren't you being what I've always seen black men and boys to be you know on television and depicted in literature and theater and all of that right so basically why can't you fit in this box that I need you to fit in you're making me uncomfortable and so, therefore you need to change. So I just wanted to quickly, before you respond, read this part for um, everyone with us today. Uh, Jira writes, the void it seems is not something one ages out of by default. Your appearance was viewed as so incongruous with your work product that the most plausible explanation for the discrepancy was that you plagiarized. The solution to the riddle that my own appearance and creative work presented was that the latter was necessarily satirical. My horrified recognition of that unhappy convergence between a teenage black artist facing roadblocks to finding his voice and a young adult encountering a scrambled version of the same impediments was the catalyst for your mixtape. Punk and straight edge culture have served me as a kind of aesthetic equipment for living that Albert Murray argues African-Americans in mass have found in blues music. The continuities between your experience and, my, and mine across the supposed generation gap suggest that punk might function as equipment for navigating exactly the kinds of conundrums you're likely to face as you come of age as well. It is a peculiar form of invisibility to have one's deliberate self-definition and disclosure flatly dismissed for its non-compliance with racist expectations. Vivid, honest, and thoughtfully rendered as a black self-portrait might be, it is competing for real estate in imaginations, white and otherwise, which are largely monopolized by the phantom projections of ethnocentrism. And yet, I don't quite blame my audience, your newspaper advisor or my professor, you and I have no representatives on TV. We are not in the news. There are no stock characters in movies to which you and I are tidally compared. That's so beautiful, Jira. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And it's just like this little nugget that really kind of puts the book into perspective. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk to us a little bit about that, um, this, this portion and also about what we were speaking about, about just like not being able to fit into this imagination and having to navigate that, which is essentially what you're exploring throughout the entire book. And I just felt like this was such a great little nut graph um, to kind of express to everyone with us today about what the book is grounded in. Yeah, thanks so much for peeling that out and sharing it with us and uh, reading it in a way that almost conceals how long-winded and messy that paragraph really is. Um, <laughs> Stop. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm not kidding. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. So what's going on in that passage, just to put a little bit of narrative meat on it, is, of course, that uh, my brother has been contributing pieces to his middle school newspaper. And 
just based on the fact that he doesn't look or behave like someone who in his teacher's mind would write the kinds of things he wrote. Right. Uh, because Jossie, by the way, is also really tall, right? Like he's, you call him, you, you, you compare him to Boo Radley, an, an internet surfing Boo Radley of today's time, right? Yeah. So, I mean, his appearance plays a role. Obviously his blackness plays a role, his, his affect. He's not, um, I call him an artist in reticence with the T cause he <laughs> really doesn't talk much. So, um, for, for whatever reason, his teacher is like, the only way this kid could be bringing me these articles is if he's plagiarizing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, upon hearing this story, I realized that it, there's absolutely a parallel between what he's going through and what I'm dealing with um, as an MFA student in nonfiction writing. I'm having a, a variant of that reaction um, from the professor I'm working with in that semester. And it's one of those moments where you have to uh, sort of, it, it's one of those things that flouts the way we usually talk about racism and um, how these things change over generations or how people become more enlightened or more receptive, j just you know by default, just because time passed, right? And uh, I actually mm -hmm. wonder, you know, having my brother as a foil in this respect has made me think like, there's always this haste um, to get past racism. And I wonder if we should actually think of it more like we think of climate change, right? Like what if there was something more like the Paris Agreement where instead of saying like, we're gonna have a summer of posting black boxes on Instagram and all this stuff is gonna be behind us, we accept it's gonna take uh, one generation decreasing carbon emissions, this percentage. And then the next generation is gonna have to accept the baton and they're gonna have to decrease carbon emissions from there. And then maybe that next generation will get to a point uh, after accepting the baton from two previous equally committed generations um, where th the difference is appreciable, right? Where the problem has not subsided, uh, but has diminished enough that, that we can um, feel, feel comfortable that, that, you know, progress has been made. We're not gonna spike the football, but we can, we can recognize the difference. And then maybe the generation after that, right, can inherit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a world where it's no longer a problem. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the damage we've done to the environment is something we can recognize as requiring that kind of sustained attention and commitment, um, then responding to racism and sort of the limitations of, of people's imaginations um, is something we, we should be able to look at with the same patience. And I think having uh, a brother with you know, some qualities in common who's a Zoomer uh, and having a report with him about this kind of stuff makes it impossible not to think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. And I mean, I wanna talk more about that when Jossie's on with us. Um, I know we have to move along, but I did want to also touch on the fact that not only, <laughs> yeah, I agree, Matt snaps on racism and climate change. Absolutely, I love that comparison. And I'm gonna start using that when I talk to people. Um, so Jira also is a musician who creates funk music, right? So I wanted to speak also about how you, in thinking about climate change and thinking about having to make changes incrementally, it seems like you've established a kind of structure for your life that, that I really, you know, admire, which is you have all these different parts of yourself that you use to express and explore. You're not just a writer, right? Like you have a lot of different artistic expression. And I'm curious about how your relationship with being a punk music artist um, and then having, and then writing this book at the same time. So you're writing albums, which you have an album out um, with your group Baby Got Back Talk and then you have this book and I'm curious about how the creative processes lended themselves to each other um, for you in this with writing this book well I appreciate the question I do want to invite uh, Jossie into this sooner than later um, can we bring Jossie in now well yeah why don't we do that ta-da <laughs> Magic. Hi, Jossie. Hello. Thank you for coming in with us. 
Yeah, thank you for having me. So, so Jossie, go ahead. I was going to, Jira, why don't you introduce Jossie? Well, this is the uh, eponymous figure in the book. My um, younger brother, Jossie, he's a freshman at Emerson College, a writer in his own right, a published poet, um, and a an incisive presence and, you know, and a wonderful addition to almost any conversation, but definitely uh, a particularly canny voice in this one. Jossie, I was kind of wondering how that stuff about um, you know, the idea that, that these problems just naturally change over the course of generations sat with you. And even, you know, maybe you could speak to the people about like how you felt reading the book and recognizing these continuities between our experience that we're often told um, shouldn't be the case or like, you know, on their way out. Yeah, lots of people among my generation and older have this notion that racism is just gonna like dissipate over time without any real work done to dismantle it. And there's many examples in the book of us telling each other parallel stories um, despite being uh, 14 years apart. And yeah, I just have to say, it's like, we need to, definitely think more deeply about it than just ignore it and say it's going to disappear. Um, yeah. So Jossie, I'm so Jira just introduced you as a freshman at Emerson, which I didn't know, um, but also that you're still a writer. And in this section that I read from earlier, which I think you heard, it talks about uh, this wasn't included in the section, but just before it says that you no longer wanted to work at the newspaper after this advisor had basically expressed that you were plagiarizing and you had gone to your mother, the Black Mamba, and expressed to her that you no longer wanted to be in the paper. So it kind of leaves it there in the book. So I was thinking that perhaps you had stepped away from your writing um, exploration. Are you, So you are still writing and how did you make the adjustment between that experience and where you are today? And for my middle school paper, I had just finished the year unenthusiastically and I didn't really continue with journalism, but I still do creative writing. Um, in high school, I was the editor in chief of our student run literary magazine and now I like write in my free time, mostly poetry and fiction. Um, nice. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you didn't stop after that terrible experience. Me too. <laughs> so I do wanna ask you how you feel about this book. So your older brother, he's 14 years older than you. You're basically a generation apart and he's written this book to you and I think that there is this, I have two brothers and there was always this like idea that these older black male figures should just come in and kind of offer you um, advice that you don't really want. And in this really kind of tough way, like man up and like people would just like come and punch my brothers in the chest when they were little, just kind of like as a hello, which I always found to be really weird. Um, but I'm sure that you've had other people and figures in your life trying to kind of push you more in, into a type of box. Even, even older Black men have the tendency to also do this. It doesn't have to just be teachers or white instructors. It can also be uncles and cousins and even brothers who want to try to make you into a kind of stereotypical figure. So I'm curious about how this approach that Jira has taken to write this mixtape to you, um, how you've read it, how you've received it, and how it's how it's been for you to have been a part of this process. I think that the rhetorical style Jira employs in the book is um, very helpful in sending the message of ways to conduct yourself. Um, as a black man and thinker in this country. I think 
that kind of rhetoric coming from older figures for me has normally been um, a little bit tired as it, I don't think most black men need to be reminded of the danger of being a black man in the country as every piece of media um, reminds us that. So Jira using something that's inherently like anti-authoritative and non-preachy um, <laughs> like punk music is a good way of sending a message of how to be like kind of an individual. Right. And yeah. have you all like, go ahead, Jira. I'm just curious if you had like some workshops or <laughs> feedback or was Jossie a part of your process, Jira, like in a craft way? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is the conversations we had that informed the book were really pretty continuous with the conversations we have organically. It's just, there were a couple of times where I had my tape recorder running um, um, there were a couple of times where he left the room and then I like immediately scribbled down what he said. Uh, but you know, it wasn't like, okay, Jossie, sit down for the boys and the bullet <laughs> interviews. Da, da, da. Um, which I think, you know, <laughs> to Jossie's own point about like trying to, um, cultivate a tenor of that conversation that is not overly preacher or overly formal, um, you know kind of had to be that way the the, the craft process kind of had to be that way to achieve that uh jossie made mention of this idea you know that one of the main messages uh black people get overall is how oppressed is about how oppressed they are uh but black men when they are you know inundated with that sentiment uh it's rare that they're also encouraged to think about the ways that they are op oppressive right and so one of the chapters in the book um, a couple of them really, but one where that idea really swings into stage center is uh, ever since I was a little girl, which is uh -huh. an adaptation of uh, I'm not going to teach your boyfriend how to dance with you by the band Black Kids. And so I was actually curious to, to talk to you, Sasha, about how that um, chapter sat with you as a reader, uh, because, you know, a thing Jossie and I have, have mused together about is like, what would it mean if there was a gender focused variant of the talk, right? The, the conversation people have with black kids about uh, how not to get murdered by the police, essentially, uh, that was mm -hmm. delivered with the same regularity, right? What if, you know, people being aware of power disparities between black men and black people of other genders was something that was kind of built into our culture the same way survive at these great costs is built into mm -hmm. our culture. Um, what was your experience of that chapter? Um, did you have any kind of reaction to it? I um, mean, I felt like, wait, were you asking Jossie? Or are you asking me? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, go ahead, Jossie. I'll, 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 I'll riff off you. <laughs> um, well, of course we had talked about this a little, um, but I think that kind of talk is definitely not I wouldn't say common at all, uh, even though it seems like it'd be instrumental in helping diffuse uh, social situations and using some of the privileges we have as men to like extend a helping hand that we sometimes ask other people to do. Mm. So yeah, I think it what you propose in the book Definitely is a good idea. Is that something that you all spoke about openly in your home? Or is this something that you've kind of explored more as you become an adult, Jira? Because I don't think there was a, I don't think I recall your mom being a part of that section, um, but she has like such, the, she has such a big role and she's, I love her character. Um, throughout the book and the way you depict her with so much complexity, which also lends itself to what we're discussing right now. It's like you being able to see her not just as a mother, but also as a black woman raising black children. 
Yeah, well, it, it's funny. It, it doesn't come up explicitly in the book, but um, I would say that chapter is very much informed um, by my mother's politics um, and sort of the messages about being aware of your place in a power structure um, that were kind of always a part of the, the regular household conversation, right? And I think I was just trying to... Um, you know, play my own role in the transmission of that kind of feminist consciousness uh, as, as an older brother to say, there's a temptation for any conversation between the two of us to completely leave this stuff out. Um, mm -hmm. Let's make sure that it doesn't do that. And in fact, um, you know, let's be aware of the possibility that that particular uh, variants of that consciousness uh, can emerge specifically from from two dudes of different generations talking to each other in this way, um, talking to each other in conversation with thinkers like June Jordan, uh, with mm -hmm. thinkers like Kimberly Crenshaw, with you know the Combahee River Collective, who all figure into that chapter, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, my brother's own kind of like uh, feedback about what his own um, experience of being socialized into masculinity is in these times played a big role. Like Jossie had a uh, observation to me one time where he was like, you know, sometimes I think people basically overthink uh, what masculinity is. What it really is in this day and age is when all the women leave the room, one dude leaning over to another and being like, yo, is she bad, bro? <laughs> She's bad, bro. Um, and and I, that stuck with me because I was like, yeah, that's kind of what it was when I was in high school too. So the needle's not really moving much on that front. Right. I mean, I do want to just pick out one thing you said um, in just now. You said that your mom was always trying to help you all understand your position um, in society. And I think that that's something you bring in a lot of thinkers and writers in your book, like a lot of different quotes. You have Amiri Baraka. And then you, in the very beginning, you're what really came to, what came to my mind also was Ralph Ellison. And you talk about you know, the idea of the, being the invisible man um, and how, how your mom, how you, both of you, this is a question for both of you, how your mother introduced you to your place in society, because that can go both ways, right? Like there have been, there's been writing about black men whose mothers have positioned them in a way that makes them feel even more inferior than the outside world because they introduce them to their place in a way that feels very violent. So I'm curious about what that was like for both of you in your household, being introduced to it, but also not feeling oppressed by it, by this introduction. Yeah, well, Jossie, uh, you, you can take the lead on that. I'm interested in your answer. I wouldn't say our mother raised us in a way that um, made us feel inferior among an already inferior um, group in society. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that she mostly like talked to us about the dangers that can occur um, and some ways we can try and avoid them as well as um, kind of like showing us ways we can be protective of each other and by each other I mean um, our brothers and sister not just our brothers mm -hmm. and you agree with that Jira well, there's a chapter in the book called PMA, which is playing on uh, Bad Brain's notion of positive mental attitude. But my, you know, my chapter is called positivist mental attitude, right? This idea of understanding reality through social positivism. And I kind of crack on my mom in there about how she's like the ultimate social positivist because one of her main uh, refrains was, um, yes, the world is unjust. And so now, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, uh, I don't know. I think someone kind of, um, 
emphasizing that banging the drum for that perspective from an early age sort of took the sting out of it in a way which right. I talk, like I almost had to learn to to back up and be like wait you know maybe it makes sense for people to be very bummed out that the world is unjust right maybe mm-hmm. even be paralyzed by that awareness you know um but the way uh you know like Jazzy says since that was such a a conversation from jump um yeah I don't even I don't even know that I I knew to have a like a to be really disheartened by it it was kind of like being told the sky was blue yeah, yeah, we've talked about that a lot. You always kind of, I'll, I'll call you kind of outraged, like, oh my God, can you believe what's happening in the news? And you're like, yeah, I totally, I mean, this has been happening for hundreds of years. It's not surprising. And I'm like, I'm calling someone else who has more energy for me. <laughs> so I do want to remind everyone that you can put questions in the question box and we're going to move into questions. But right before we move into them, I just wanted to first touch on quickly the title. Um, which we haven't talked about yet, um, because you just brought up the PMA, each chapter is kind of kind of plays off of another title of um, whether it be music or other uh, pop culture references or punk references. And then you use the 1991 John Singleton film, Boys in the Hood, which kind of explores, uh, you know, the black family and black interiority in a certain way. And then you kind of playing off of that and how you made that decision to make your work, which centers punk rock and blackness in connection with this film, which could be seen as so dissimilar. I want, I was curious if you could express what similarities you were um, expressing there. Yeah, yeah, I'll address this quick. Uh, I see Kira's back, so we should probably get to questions. I would just say, uh, you know, Furious Styles and Trey in that movie, Boys in the Hood, right, are such a, a visible um, and revered symbol of what that kind of intergenerational conversation among Black folks can look like. And I kind of wanted to position myself in opposition to that model, right, to take on like a different tone, uh, to use different reference points, um, and hopefully to usher some some representations of Blackness, some, some Black experiences to the fore that that movies like Boys in the Hood um, and others of their ilk kind of directly preclude, right? Like that takes up so much capital um, in terms of the, the the pop cultural representation of what blackness is like. I kind of wanted to um, put a spin on that, like wink at it, but also announce to the reader from Jump that this is something uh, other than that and um, urgently necessary as well in part because it's other than that. Right, right. Hi, Kira. Hey, y'all, this has just been, this has just been, this has just been incredible. (laughs) It really has been. Uh, Sasha, your questions have been so wonderful and the answers here have been so um, deep. This has been amazing. Um, I want to invite, y'all to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, but as the hostess, I get the first question. So, ha ha. Um, and, and my question um, for, for everybody here actually um, has to do with that intergenerational conversation. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, this book is being marketed as a conversation between millennials and the Gen Z. And I think that that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, and, and as a millennial myself, and as we, as this generation, reconcile with not being the new hotness anymore, right? We're, we're ascending into whatever comes after being the new hotness. Um, what do you say about how, how millennials are supposed to um, bestow this knowledge, these, this hard one, these hard one things, these knowings that we know? Um, does your book herald that new, that new kind of conversation, because I feel like, uh, you know, the generations above get to do this however they want to. Um, And what would you say to other millennials who are writing um, about presenting our unique knowings, because we have them, um, to the folks, the folks above and the folks coming behind? Yeah, who'd like to respond to that first, either of you two? Was that, I think that question was for you, Jira. <laughs> You're the writer on this one, but I'll take it from either of you. 
I'm curious that it was for everybody. Um, well, so I, as I, you know, I feel like I've, I'm banging this drum constantly, but to me, the key uh, is to sort of maybe think beyond some of the traditionally default antagonistic posturings that we have um, about how we respond to people older and younger than us. Um, and, you know, in connection to the climate change thing, right? Like begin from an awareness of the, the massive continuities across generations. Um, I think that's really important. I think uh, there's a way where we can almost like default otherize somebody who's born in 2002, um, like, oh, you're on TikTok. So that necessarily means, you know, we have nothing in common. It's, it's wildly different from my space or whatever it is. And I find those kinds of um, poses a, a bit too facile. So uh, I, one, it's, you know, begin with an awareness of the similarities, but two, maybe proceeding with an understanding that everyone has something to learn and everyone has something to teach. So, you know, I don't want someone who's a generation above me to talk down to me as if I have nothing to offer, as if I have no insight of my own, as if I'm not a canny processor of my own experience, right? But at the same time, I do want to hear from them and I do want to uh, have access to whatever they've accumulated over, over the course of their time on the planet. And if I know that's the the rapport I want to have with someone older than me, then I should model the same behavior in terms of how I, uh, you know, communicate with folks younger. And this is one thing I love about Jira so much. It's like a, a kind of empathy and understanding for everyone of all spaces. Um, because uh, I just, I admire this man so much. He's just so brilliant. He's so patient. And when I met Jira, I was kind of like at this little crossroads in my life, like switching, just switching careers and like going to school. And I was just such a mess, really. And he still was so generous and kind to me. It's still like, Sasha, what, what are you saying? You know, um, just around ideas around anti-Blackness and like um, ways that I was thinking that he was able to like, that we grew so much together, but also that he wasn't like, this girl doesn't know anything and I don't want to be friends with her. He was just like understanding that everyone is coming from a different place um, and that's okay. And, and I really appreciate that about him. And I think that that kind of generosity lends itself in his work as well um, in the way that he's, that he's writing his sentences and also um, in the way that he's creating his music. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, let's move to some of the questions in the Q&A. So the first um, comes from Jesse, um, who says, congratulations, Jira, as we have said many times. Um, just curious uh, if you've sent your book to any of your punk heroes or influences, mm -hmm. like are any of them aware of it or do you want them to be aware of it? Uh, thanks for the question, Jesse. Really appreciate you being here. Um, yeah, you know, I haven't really thought about that component of it yet. I had a brief exchange with uh, Chris number two from Anti Flag on Twitter, where he had like liked uh, something about the book, not knowing that Anti Flag is uh, the first entry on the mixtape. A song by them is the first entry on the mixtape, and he was pretty stoked when I told him. So I think when that happened, I thought, oh yeah, maybe that would be something to do to kind of reach out to some of the other bands on there. Um, teenage me would be so geeked that uh, a <laughs> member of anti-flag even cared. So, you know, that's um, that I, rewarding teenage me, making teenage me stoked is always a good thing. So maybe I'll pursue it. Yes, and that's a great stoked. question, Jesse. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, this next question is for you, Jesse. Um, uh, somebody anonymous out there would like to know what type of fiction you're writing. Are you writing thrillers? Are you writing sci-fi? What can we look forward to? Um, I like writing all kinds of fiction, but most recently I've been into like science fiction and fantasy writing. Um, yeah, I've also done probably the most uh, the realistic fiction um out of every every fiction genre but i don't really shy away from anything that's cool i'm looking forward to we're looking forward to what the, what it's going to be 
and what comes I out know. into the world. It's going to be good. We can see. Um, all right. Our next question comes from Matt. Matt, I'm going to edit your, your question a little bit because it goes on for a sec. Um, so g in being a brother and an interviewer in, for this book, have you found any new clarity or new perspective on being a man, on being a Black man, or on how to be a person to look up to? Um, something that's spending time with Jossie specifically has made you reflect on. Matt, you're the man. Thanks so much for being here and for the really thoughtful question. Um, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, it's funny. You, you sort of begin with the problem as a nonfiction writer and you try to write your way to the answer. And I think the project of having to explain certain commitments to my brother uh, at length has illuminated my own motives and sort of renewed my own idealism um, in a way that I don't think anything else could. You know, sometimes it's just like really good to be accountable for the things you've done and the things that you love and to have to make the case for uh, why you're committed to them because it can kind of get automated at a certain point. Um, and, you know, I'm grateful to Jossie. I'm grateful to Beacon um, for, for giving me an opportunity to sort of... Uh, heighten my own awareness of why punk and straight edge um, and you know, post-conventional identity are all things that have become um, really central for me and really grounding for me. Yes. Um, Rakia, I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name right. I believe the pronunciation is Rakia. Would like to know, dare I ask, is it too soon to ask if you're working, of, uh, if you're thinking about book two yet? Rakia is the uh, person who pulled the diamond out of the rough as far as this book. The book would not exist without her. So thank you so much for the question and for being here. And of course, for caring and believing uh, in this project before it was a thing. Um, I'm definitely thinking about book two. Uh, I've got some stuff, you know, it's, it's on its way. I'm not sure how much to talk about at this stage, but um, I... It all kind of stemmed from what I see as like a, uh, uh, a, a really heightened preoccupation with awkwardness in culture right now. I'm always really interested <laughs> in awkwardness as a phenomenon. Um, I see people calling things awkward as sort of like um, connected to a kind of interpretive impatience, right? Like we want things to be on the surface and for whatever reason in a given social interaction, they're not. We could ask, we could, we could excavate what's ever going on uh, beneath the surface, but we have all these incentives to not do that, right? So I'm working on a project that is kind of um, geared towards looking at other ways of relating to one another that don't kind of like fall back on, you know, some of the, some of the most familiar and visible tropes uh, of this century. I want to I dig know. all the way into that. I, I, as a person who's just awkward now, I just want to explore more <laughs> about what that is and, and what I'm doing when I think that I'm awkward and things are awkward. <laughs> That's the greatest thing ever. Um, we're going to, I just, I'm going to send you an email. All right. So Rebecca would like to know, first of all, Rebecca says, hello and congrats. And then um, she says, I'm curious to hear a bit more about how both of you found your way to punk and straight edge. If both of you refers to Jossie and I, I don't think Jossie has, has found his way to the latter, at least. Uh, thanks very much for the question, Rebecca, and for attending. Um, for me, it was uh, actually a book, which I write about, like having how funny it is to have like an origin story that begins with a book and then to end up writing a book. Um, it was a book called The Philosophy of Punk by Craig O'Hara. And I think I was really attracted to the idea that punk music was guided by a, a particular way of looking at the world, a particular set of principles and values. Um, and I think as like a 14 year old, which is about how old I was, I was feeling like a conspicuous lack of really sturdy philosophical moorings. And someone saying like, oh, this loud, fast, kind of dangerous, transgressive, but glamorous music has like a, 
a lens that comes with it was super exciting to me. Um, and so one aspect of that lens was this idea that if you had a humanitarian view of the world, if you were invested um, in, in building a more prosperous future, then it also made sense to invest in yourself, to invest in your own prosper, excuse me, longevity, right? And straight edge, um, the planks of which are, you know, no drinking, no drugs, no promiscuous sex was a, a kind of extreme um, and at that age, appealingly extreme take on this idea that um, if you're someone who's working in the service of creating a better world, then you got to do stuff to make sure you're going to be around to see it. And, uh, you know, that for whatever bizarre reason that that really resonated with me and I, I got with it, got with the program. So uh, it's eight o'clock, which is just, uh, it's 8.01, which is just kind of crazy. Um, but there are more questions here in the Q&A. And so I just wanna, is, is, can we stick around for a couple of minutes or do, do y'all have to bounce? Well, I'm good. You're good? Yeah, yeah, me too. I also, yeah. I wanna know the answers to these questions as well, especially okay, Rak Rakia's question about what Jossie's favorite essay was. Yes. That's a great question. Um. I liked Mad Props to the Madness, um, probably the most. Um, we, I don't know, I think we, me and Jira, that's probably out of everything, um, all the topics covered in the book, that's probably what we've discussed the least with each other. And as a family, I don't think we discuss, um, we actually do discuss like, like uh, mental health and such, but not in the way that it is presented in the book, which I think will be interesting for people to read once they get their hands on it. Mm -hmm. G-Rod, do you have a favorite? Um, you know, I don't, I don't. Uh, I'm surprised Jossie picked Mad Props. Uh, I don't think I would have selected that one. As I mentioned, I like ever since I was a little girl a lot. And I also like that I say American idiolect just because um, it involves references to Dodger from Oliver and Company, a dog voiced by Billy Joel. Um, I remember most people have read that essay are like really mad that Billy Joel is in it. There's a lot of Billy Joel detractors. Um, <laughs> and so that makes me enjoy the essay more, you know, like retrieving the dignity of Billy Joel. Great. That's just so fascinating this is so good um rihanna wants to know uh when things are safer will you be considering doing a book at book dash band tour so i'm gonna put slash on that like can you combine them both are there gonna be different things are you gonna do it oh that would be amazing what combine them both in awesome yeah yeah Well, first of all, shout out to Rihanna. That's my bandmate, the violinist in Baby Got Back Talk. You should check them and us out in, uh, you know, live when that can be possible again. And in the meantime, on the interweb, that's Baby Got Back Talk. Thanks for the question, Rihanna. Thanks for showing up. Um, I think rocking and reading in the same space is in order. Like, I know it's going to happen. Just hard to predict how and when right now. I love that idea of rocking and reading. Like, rock, yes. And also we're gonna have to do something <laughs> like that at the bookstore. That's now a thing, just rocking and reading in the same space That's in a, a bookstore. Plan. Yes, my boss is gonna kill me. That's okay, we're gonna do it, it's gonna be great. Um, Scott would like to know, how does so writing songs differ from writing something else? So a book, an essay, what's it like? Scott, thanks so much for the question and for your attendance. Uh, miss you, dude. To me, there's like more um, overlap between the two than I think is maybe popularly conceived of. Like one of the chapters in the book kind of jokes about, uh, Jossie and I have actually talked about this, how when I first started writing songs, like my bandmates would often, they'd be kind of like mystified by the sorts of words that would end up in there. Um, and my willingness to let my literary inclination and my musical inclinations kind of blend with one another put some people off. Um, I do think there's like a kind of orthodoxy about songwriting where like certain words don't belong or you have to keep things simple, you know, K what is it? 
kiss keep it simple stupid um i openly and comfortably flout that there's lots of times where i have an idea for an essay that once i start um kind of teasing it out i realized it would actually make a much better rock song um so keeping those two things separate or like even understanding uh how to direct traffic in that way is uh has never been that intuitive to me but i think the the tangle is actually more fun and i hope makes her more interesting art mm. yes yes I'm loving this. Love right, your enthusiasm here. I just, I love, I am loving, I'm just having, this is just feeding me on so many levels. I'm so grateful for <laughs> this. Um, I, okay, we have three more questions. Um, I, I, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name right. Priska, I hope that I pronounced that right, um, has a great question. Um, she wants to know, can you talk about your journey to this moment? Um, you, you talked about your eighth grade writing. So can you talk about your journey from that to now this moment as a professional writer? What would middle school g talk about like being a teenage, you know, stoking your teenage self, um, think about this book um, and this big moment? Priska, you're my heart. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much for the question. Long time friend, first time caller, I think. Uh, I would say the really cool thing about this moment is that like the book sort of begins at a, at a point when, when Jossie was sort of like a, you know, a, a rebellious angsty teen who, you know, my parents worried about. Um, and also not coincidentally uh, shared some qualities with, with my teenage iteration. So I think one thing I wanted the trajectory of the book to establish is like, you can be this kid who's, like not really feeling school, not really showing up, not really participating, um, and still find uh, a way forward where you can like be a, you know, a free ranging intellectual who's not necessarily um, focused on scholastic achievement, but is still interested in knowledge, still interested in creativity. Uh, and that sort of recalcitrance, that sort of like uh, unwillingness to be cowed can actually be propulsive in that journey. Instead of it being this liability that you're someone who takes no shit, takes no prisoners, um, it can actually be a strength if you if you can channel it the right way. And so I think eighth grade Jira uh, would have a hard time picturing how we close the distance between that moment and this one. Uh, but I think it's pretty cool that the book um, demonstrates for Jossie how it can be done and more importantly, that it can be done. Yes, Lordy, yes. And and not just Jossie, but so many others, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sabrina would like to know, um, can you talk a little about um, Black feminist thoughts, always, yes, um, and its influence on your punk ethos? Uh, you pay major homage to um, June Jordan, Kim Crenshaw, so where, where is, does that intersect ha -ha, with your work? Yeah. Nice. Excellent question, Sabrina. I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Thanks for being here. Um, I, the way it, so it, here's one way we can think about it. Punk on its face sounds way more democratic than it actually is, right? It announces itself as having this really inclusive approach. It announces itself as being a, uh, you know, a, a form that encourages freedom of expression and freedom of identity for everybody. And then in its practical reality, uh, it's mostly not that, right? So one thing I talk about in the book is sort of using a Black feminist rubric to evaluate how punk is being applied or celebrated. Um, you know, June Jordan says uh, the strength of a democracy is not determined by the state of the strong, but by the state of the weak, right? If the strong are having a great time in democracy, okay, cool, but that doesn't really tell us anything. The thing we need to question is, are the most disfranchised people uh, served by the structure in place? And if they're not, uh, we use the most disfranchised people as like the, the case study, the barometer um, and we, until we elevate their lot, then we haven't really approached democracy. We haven't really improved anything. 
Um, and obviously that's a principle principle that's also um, like a core plank of intersectionality. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned Kim Crenshaw who figures in the book who is a mentor and a former employer of mine. Um, but applying that principle to punk rock right, is something that maybe wasn't happening when I was coming up. And I've been really excited as an adult to see a lot of bands that are really thinking about how can we um, extend this tradition in a way that lives up to its ideals, that is looking at the most disfranchised folks and, and trying to make specific uh, progress at including and elevating them. Um, and you know, I'm fortunate to to all the thinkers who who came before Kim, who came before June Jordan, who have sort of like built up this long history of all that. Because, um, you know, in the book I mentioned, there's a temptation to kind of take a really myopic view of of our own freedom. Uh, hey, I'm a black man. I'm really frustrated that I'm, you know, alienated in terms of my race. I'm just going to focus on that. But uh, the thinkers that I mentioned. Um, provide a corrective to that and provide a corrective to the default lens in punk as well. I don't want this to end. I just don't want this to end. There's one more question um, from Lauren. Lauren wants to know what advice would you give to upcoming generations on staying true to yourself despite societal pressures to fit into a certain box? Lauren, so good to hear from you. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, Lauren is an old vet uh, who, who has some shared experience with me related to the chapter called uh, Ace Up My Sleeve. Just throwing that out there. Hint, hint, it involves P.F. Chang's. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, advice, I don't know, maybe Jossie would be more equipped to answer that question. What do you think um, is helpful to keep in mind in terms of resisting that urge to conform? Well, I'd say think about the people you know that have conformed and ask yourself if you really want to be like them. That's what I do, Josie. That's like literally so concise and perfect. Yeah, right. Uh, the cost, you know, you can, you can look for cautionary examples. I think that's, I think that's wise. Um, you know, it's funny that you put it that way, Jossie, because that idea of like, do you really want to be like them? is such a totemic punk phrase. It's like the lyric in a popular Good Charlotte song, the anthem, you know? So that sensibility that you just summed up so um, pithily is like, that's like the backbone of uh, punk as a tradition. And I'm with it. I think you're right. Same. And that's such a great note to wrap up on, Dossie. Like, that's that's perfect. It was perfection. It really was. Yes. Um, so, I, so we we've come to the end of the questions. We've come to a quarter past this hour that we had together. Um, but it was just too good. It was too good to end. Um, and I'm sorry to have to wrap this up. Um, are there any just final thoughts, any final thank yous, acknowledgements, anything floating um, that you want to say before we log off this evening? I, I just, just want to thank Jira for being for inviting us. Firstly, <laughs> sorry, Jira. Um, this was incredible to be and also to meet Jossie here online. Um, and Kira for being so gracious and also being so uh, enthusiastic. Um, thank you all. Silver Unicorn Bookstore, we really appreciate you hosting us. Thanks for letting me bring my two muses um, to celebrate this book and to hopefully have a you know provocative conversation. And I really appreciate everybody who showed up and offered these really incisive questions. And of course, can't forget you, Kira. You've been a tremendous MC, and we appreciate you so much as well. It's been an honor. It's been a true honor. This book is so awesome. I'm glad. I, I'm, I'm grateful, and I'm honored to have been part of this launch. Um, your book is beautiful. Thank you so much for showing us. Come on, camera, focus. There we go. 
There it is. Boys in the Void, a mixtape to my brother is available today and we got to launch it. And that's a big, big deal. And for those of you who are the, uh, in the audience, if you don't already have uh, your hands around this book, you need to stop what you're doing and get it. At an independent, ooh, so much emphasis on an, at an independent bookstore near you. We have it at the Silver Unicorn. We would love to get some signed copies at the Silver Unicorn. G Rob, just put that out coming there. Soon, coming soon. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, so if you are not around here and you would like a signed copy of this book, then you can go to silverunicornbooks.com and put in the comments, I would like a signed copy, please. And we will work on that for you. You can also just pop by the bookstore and get it. We can have seven people in the store right now and we want one of those seven people to be you. Um, and if you are, if you're far, far away, that's okay. Just find an independent bookstore near you to go pick up this book. Congratulations. Happy launch. I hope you're going to go have awesome dinner or pop some champagne or do something else to celebrate um, this book. And we hope that we will see you again for your next project. Um, come see us. And um, I don't know why my phone's blowing up. It's probably because I get to be with these cool people. We want to know what's up. Um, so come see us. Stay safe out there. Keep writing. We can't wait to celebrate you. Jossie, it was such a pleasure to meet you. Sasha, it was such a pleasure to meet you. This has been a joy. Same. Yes, Thank congratulations, so Jira. Thanks, everyone. Be safe. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Good night, y'all. Up the punks. Yes. Mm.